This is Lecture 6A for Calculus 1 on Volumes. To compute volumes of arbitrary solids, we follow the same procedure that we've done all the way through this class. We find some simple shape that we know how to compute. In this case, we know slabs and we know shells. So we approximate the object with little objects, little slabs or little shells. Then we refine the approximation by using more and more slabs or shells. Finally, we take the limit and call it the volume of the object. Then we use algebra and the fundamental theorem of calculus, if possible, to write these areas and radii um, so that we can take the sum and rewrite it as an integral. Then all we have to do is evaluate this definite integral, and we don't have to draw little slabs and little shells anymore. I'm just going to review again for you how um, the whole process was done to develop the derivative and to develop the integral. To develop the derivative, we, didn't, we wanted the slope along an arbitrary curve at, at any point. We didn't know how to compute it, but you know how to compute a straight line slope. So we draw straight lines and approximate, and approximate the slope along a curve by straight lines. Then we refine that straight line approximation by taking points closer and closer together until we can't take them any more close together. And we jump over that problem by taking the limit. We call the limit, we call what we get in the limit, the slope of the object at that point. Then we used algebra and the difference quotient to, um, to develop a formula. We had the word slope before, we replaced it with derivative and then after a while the derivative took on a life of its own. Okay, Then we wanted to develop integral calculus, so we started off trying to compute the area, arbitrary area, under or the area under arbitrary curves. We don't know how to do it, but we know how to compute the area of rectangles. So we make an approximation using rectangles. Then we make a, you know, a finer and finer approximation using more and more rectangles. We get to a certain point, of course we can't get any smaller on the rectangles, but we can jump over that problem by taking the limit. We call what we get in the limit the area under the curve. Then we use algebra and fundamental theorem of calculus to show that we can take all that um, the discrete sum and turn it into a definite integral. Now all we have to do is evaluate the definite integral and we call that the area under the curve. Of course we've worked with areas and now we have the value of the definite integral and so we kind of drop the word area, although we use it sometimes, and we just go with the idea of integral, and the whole idea of integral calculus takes on a life of its own. So you're seeing exactly the same thing here. We want the volume of an object. We don't know how to do it. We approximate with something we know how to um, compute the volume for. Refine the approximation. Get to a point where we can't refine it anymore. Jump over that problem by taking the limit. Okay, then we could do that. That's our numerical method. But if we can use algebra and the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can write these discrete volumes in terms of integrals, and then all we have to do is evaluate a discrete interval. Integral, I'm sorry. Here are the two main methods. One is the slab method. For this method, the object requ you, you require no symmetry of the object at all. And what you do is you consider it to be a loaf of bread, and you sit it on the x-axis, and it will occupy the space between x equal a and x equal b. Then you slice it up, just like you would slice a loaf of bread up. Okay, except you assume that each slice has a constant cross-sectional area. So here with this first object right here, and you notice that the curve of it is it, very curved. Okay, but once you uh, cut it up in these slabs, there are like little stair steps. That doesn't show up very much, but um, you can see they're like little stair steps because you assume that the area, the cross-section area, the flat face of the slab is constant throughout the, each little slab. Of course, as you make a finer and finer uh, partition of the x-axis, you'll have more and more of these slabs, and it will actually start looking like that gentle, gradual curve that you see in the object. Now, what is the volume of a slab? The volume of a slab is a cross-sectional area times the thickness of the slab. Okay, so here's how we put that together. Let me change the color here. 
cross-sectional area times thickness. To get the thickness, we take the x-axis and partition it into a bunch of subintervals. Okay, there's our delta x. That's the thickness of each little slab. All right. How do you get the area? That's hard. All right. If the object is very irregular, you have to make a whole bunch of approximations. But where you go from this is that you're going to multiply that cross-sectional area times delta x, which is the thickness, and that will be each little volume. Then you add up all the little volumes. If you are able to write that cross-sectional area in terms of x, you can move from this discrete sum over to an integral. And in this integral, you will integrate from a to b, which is where the object is sitting in the x-axis. Your, your big old discrete delta x's now turn into infinitesimally small dx's. But you must write the area in terms of x, and that is the um, most difficult problem, difficult part of computing any of these volumes. Once you get an idea of the framework of how we're doing the slabs, then um, the next step is to write those areas. Here is the shell method. Now for the shell method, the object has to have, it must have rotational symmetry. So to center it on a coordinate system, you can put it on the coordinate system so the axis of symmetry is coincident with the y-axis. See, the, the object is just is the same right about this y-axis all around it. Okay, then you, um, instead of cutting it up into slabs, you, you like hollow it out into shells. This would be like a bunch of um, tall washers that are concentric and you just put them one inside the other. Some are taller, some are shorter, and that makes the shape of the object. You see how this object has a goes up and down? Okay, each little shell, you can see the shells going around here in a little stair-step fashion. If you make enough shells, it will gradually become a nice smooth curve like the object had. Right. That's the shell method. What is the volume of a shell? It is the circumference of the shell times the height of the shell. Let me put these in different colors. Times the height of the shell. Uh, I still don't like these colors. Okay, times the height of the shell, which I'll put that in red, times the thickness in green, which I've used before, so you kind of have an idea of it. Okay. Now, what is the thickness? You have partitioned the x-axis into a bunch of little subdivisions in, little sub-intervals. The thickness, or the length of each sub-interval, is the thickness. We have that. Now, each sub-interval defines a cylindrical shell of width delta x and height y. That y is the height. Okay, That's how high it is. And then the circumference, that's a whole distance around, uh, that shell, it would be 2 pi r, would be the circumference of the shell. So the radius you take to be some x that's in the little subinterval. So here is our circumference. So we can put all those terms together. Here's the circumference. You multiply it by the height, and then you multiply it by the thickness and then that's each little shell, then you add up all the volumes of all the little shells. Now the real hard part here, obviously the 2 pi isn't a problem. The delta x, if you make enough shells, little thin shells, that becomes dx. The x that's part of the radius out here, in yellow, can become an x. Oh, that was supposed to be yellow. Uh, my coloring scheme here is... Hmm. Okay, so here, that x and the 2 pi came from the 2 pi x right up here. So now I'm left with y. I have to write that height as a function of x. And again, that's sometimes that is the problem. So th think about these, look at some of the pictures in the book, and uh, kind of convince yourself of what you're doing. Volume is circumference times height times thickness. Thickness has to do with how far, how fine a partition you make along the x-axis. The height is the y value along that object. And you have to pick a y inside each little subinterval, just like you picked a height um, when you're trying to take the Riemann sum 
you had a little subinterval and you took the um, height of the rectangle to be some function, some value of some function somewhere in the rectangle, either on the left hand side, right hand side, or the middle, you do the same thing here to find a height. Then you have to go all the way around on the uh, for the shell. You have to do 2 pi r. Okay, and that really is 2 pi x because you've centered the object on the y axis. So here's a little minor detail. I set the loaf of bread kind of object on the x-axis. I centered the other one that I was going to use shells for. I centered that on the y-axis. There's no reason to do that. You could have put the loaf of bread vertically along the y-axis. You could have taken those shells and developed them um, with the axis of symmetry on the x-axis. You could even displace it. Um, and I'll show you an example of how to do that in a minute. Uh, so that's not a big deal once you see the method. It's usually easier to line up your object with the coordinate system, and if you have a choice of where to put your, your origin, put it very convenient for yourself. So here is an example of using the slab method. In this case, I have a pyramid, and the pyramid has um, a square base. So when the pyramid is all the way down here to x equal 3, okay. Then the sides of the pyramid, unfortunately, are also equal 3, which makes it kind of, I don't know, I would have used different numbers, but since I quote unquote borrowed this picture from a book, I have to use their numbers. All right. So uh, the base of this pyramid is a square. Sometimes the squares are big when you're out at the base. As you go towards the uh, top of the pyramid, up here at the height, those squares get smaller. All you need to know is the length of each side. The side is equal to x. Right? Um, you can see how that is. When x equals 3, the side is 3. When x equals 0, the side is 0, and it varies linearly between that. A straight line, right? Okay, so the side is equal to x. And the area is the side squared, so here's the cross-sectional area, x squared. The volume is the area, this is the slab method, times the thickness right here. Okay, so we're pretty much done because we've been able to write the area in terms of x. Now we can turn it into an integral. We're going to integrate from x equals 0 to x equals 3. That's the limits of the extent of this particular pyramid. The area is x squared and the thickness now becomes infinitesimally small dx. You can easily integrate this and get a number. That's the volume method, or the slab method. The slab method says you make these cuts along, and I'm going to say the x-axis, and you know you can rotate it, makes cuts along the x-axis, and you look at the cross-sectional area through each cut. In this case, they're always squares. So I use the, the expression for the area of the square as x squared, and then I have it. There's a special case of the slab method, and that's when you have a solid of revolution. And the solid of revolution, in the solid of revolution, that cross-sectional area is a circle. In order to write the area, all you need to know is the radius, because the area, before the area was x squared, because the cross-sectional area was a square, here the area is pi r squared, because the cross-sectional area is a circle. Now the volume is pi r squared times delta x. Right. The trick to pass over to the interval, integral, I'm sorry, is, well the pi is no problem, the dx is no problem, but you have to be able to write the r as a function of x, and that sometimes can be a little bit tricky. What you see here is with the solids of revolution, the cross-sectional area is a circle. Here's an example of computing a solid of revolution. So we're using the slab method with a cross-sectional area being a circle. For a sphere, this is obviously true. If you have a sphere, take a sphere and just make cuts along it and look at the face of everything that you cut, it's always going to be a circle. So we're okay with that. All right. So all we need to know is what is the radius of each little circle. Okay, the radius is going to be like well, that's not so good. Let's just start in the middle and go out to here. 
that's the radius. That's what we're looking for. Right. Uh, it's a little hard to develop these. It takes takes a, a little bit of time, but after a while you can start seeing it. I have a sphere, and if I just look down the sphere, I'm going to be looking at its extent and y. That's why they drew that blue line right there. That's going to give me the radius. Okay, what is it when x equals 0? When x equals 0, the radius is a. What is the radius when x equals a? It's 0, because you followed the sphere down. Right. So here is what the radius is. It's a squared minus x squared. Right. So now I have the area is pi r squared, and r squared is a y value, so it's pi times a squared minus x squared. Now if I want the volume, I have to multiply that by the each little thickness. Originally I made little thick cuts and assumed that each one was uh, a flat, like a coin, and then I piled them all up, but I'm letting them get thinner and thinner and thinner, and I'm able to go over to the to the integral because I can write the radius in terms of x. So here's my dx. The pi is still out, just comes out front. Here is the radius squared. And I integrate from minus a to a because that is the uh, extent in x that the sphere is occupying. I can um, evaluate this integral and I get 4 thirds pi r, pi r cubed, but it's um, the radius is a, so that's why I have 4 thirds pi a cubed. Here is an example um, that I talked about before, where you have an object, but its um, axis of symmetry is not on the y-axis or the x-axis, and you can still do the problem. Right? In this case, we have an object that's that is created by rotating this um, 2 minus y squared, which would be like a parabola, rotating it about the line x equal 3. Here's my axis of symmetry, x equal 3. This little sign right here, if you see that little diagram, means you took that flat surface and rotated it, therefore, thereby creating the object. All you need to know, this, this red line right here gives you the radius. Notice how the radius is going to change as you go in y. Um, it's going to be it's going to be largest right here at y equals 0. It's going to go to 0 when, x equals, or when y equals minus square root 2 and also when y equals the square root of 2. So you need an expression for that, and lucky for us, it's given right here. The radius equals 3 minus, in parentheses, y squared plus 1, or they simplified it, 2 minus y squared. So we can use that. Again, we're using slabs, but we're integrating in y. We're going to integrate first from minus square root of 2 to positive square root of 2 because that's the extent that the, the object occupies in y. I uh, first started off with little slabs in y, but I, I made so many little slabs I passed over in the interval to where they're infinitesimally small. So here's my thickness, dx. Okay, And because a cross-sectional area is a circle, then its cross-sectional area is pi r squared. That's what the pi is doing out here. Here is that radius, and it's squared. Those are all the terms. That's the setup. Right. You only have to do half the problem because of symmetry. There's another special case of the slab slash solid of revolution method, and that's called the washer method. And the idea is you have some solid of revolution. That's a solid whose cross sections are all circles, but you have taken a core out of it and the cross-sections of all the cores are circles. So you've created a washer. You had a big outside that's all um, that's circular, cross-sectional area, and then you've taken some kind of uh, other object that's uh, of a circular cross-sectional area out of the inside of it and created a washer. In this case, you can see the washer is right here. All right, it's the brown part. The green part just shows you the object, and then the darker green part is removed what you're left with is that washer. So how do you compute the area of that? It's pretty simple. You take the volume of the whole surface, the whole object on the outside with the core intact, and then you subtract the volume of the inner core that got removed. 
right? So what is the volume of the outer core? It's some big R squared dx, but that's going to vary as you go along, all right? And then subtracting little r squared, and little r squared can be the inner, the um, radius of the inner core. And both of them can depend on x. Here's an example of the washer method. In this case, we have, well, first think of it as a piece of wood, and it's a sphere of wood. And you want to make a napkin ring out of it, so you take and make a cylindrical core right through the middle where the napkin would go. All right. Okay. So you would like to know the volume of wood that's left over. Well, if you said the volume of wood, you would say, I don't have any use for that number. But here's, an, here's a situation where you might really need to do this. Say this was not a wooden napkin ring. Instead, it was a molded plastic napkin ring. So you would have some kind of mold, and plastic would go into it. And by computing this, you would compute the volume of plastic that you would need to pour in the mold. In that case, you could see it would be a very useful calculation. So we're going to use the method of washers. And we have to, um, and we'll use some symmetry too. Right. The inner core, right through here, whoops, this inner core right through here, okay, I'm kind of extending it down so you can see what I'm talking about, that is a cylinder. So it has the same radius all along. So here, I'll say the inner radius is r. What is the outer radius? This is that sphere again. All right. Remember, it has um, a radius of r. So this is oriented along the y-axis. So when y is 0, the radius is r. When y is r, the radius is 0. So we use a, the same expression that we had on the other page when we were just uh, calculating the volume of the sphere without having anything removed from the center. So now where do I integrate from? I could integrate from, uh, well, I can use symmetry. I only have to do half the problem because um, the object is symmetric about the center line. So all I'm going to do is integrate from y equals 0 to y equals h over 2. And I've written this wrong. Okay, so what is the cross-sectional area? It's 2 pi r. Here's the 2 pi. Here is the outer radius squared. Subtracted off from that is the inner radius squared of the material that um, either is cut out or isn't in existence there. Okay. Here are my limits of integration. It's 0, and this should have been h over 2, but it's h, so it's wrong. Okay, And then I have my thickness, dy. That's how you set up the problem of this washer problem for the napkin ring. Now I'm going to use that example of the shell method to compute. Uh, I'm just going to set up the problem, but this will compute the volume of this torus. Okay, so what I need here, here's the volume of a shell. 2 pi r, well 2 pi r, that's, here's my r. So I'm going to go all the way around there. In fact, I can let r vary from the inside to the outside. Then I need the thickness. The thickness will be the little cuts I make in, in delta x. And then I need the height. And the height is going to vary as a circle. It's going to go over, you know, from one side, one side of the torus to the other. So I've worked up the equation for the height and that is little r squared minus x minus r squared. Takes a little bit of work to do that. Okay, but I can put that right here. Then when I assemble it, I would have 2 pi big R times the height, which is uh, square root r squared minus x minus big R squared times delta x, the thickness. And then I can integrate from the inside of the torus to the outside. The inside is big R minus little r here. And the outside is big R plus R. And then I can integrate this. On the other hand, let me clear everything off. Okay. On the other hand, I could just look at the sketch and say, what is the cross-sectional area if I took a cut out of this torus? It is a circle. What's a cross-sectional area of that circle? It's pi little r squared. I'm talking about... I'm talking about this area in here. I only have a square marker again, so I can't make it circular, but that's the area that I'm talking about. Okay, here's the pi r squared. Well, what would happen if I looked at this thing and looked at it like a donut and cut it in half and just unfolded it? What would its length be? Or its height, or its length, whichever way you think about it. It would be 2 pi r. 
here's 2 pi r. If I multiply those together, I have the volume of the torus without integrating or anything. All I did was take a sketch and observe the sketch. And there's my answer. Pi r squared, big R times little r squared. Okay. Well, this is the final lecture in Calculus 1. I hope that with this final example, I again made the point that the first thing you do is make a sketch. And once you've made a sketch, often the problem is more than half solved. So thank you for your interest in this class. Would you please give me any feedback on um, any errors that you see on the slides or in the written, in the homework, the exams, the, um, and in the written lectures? If you have any feedback on um, what part of the lectures uh, seemed to work and seemed not to work, especially the ones that seemed not to work, I'd really appreciate that feedback. And, um, and I'll take it to heart and try to make this a better class for the next, the next group of students. Thank you.